Tanya Lacey is a Jill of all trades. She's a comedian, an actress, TV host and a roving reporter. She's appeared in numerous Australian TV shows and she's here today to talk about life and the ups and downs of her brilliant career. Tanya, welcome. Thank you so much. That's quite the intro. <laughs> to 15 Minutes of Fame. <laughs> How are you? Well, you know, busy, exhausted, tired. Comedy Festival is here, you know. Absolutely. And you, you're kind of touring around the country, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. So after here, I do Sydney and then Townsville and then Edinburgh. And before, before you uh, arrived in Melbourne, I think a couple of days ago, before you arrived, you were in the Adelaide Fringe. Yes, I was. How is that? Because I did read a review that you had and it was incredible. Well, I've had great reviews for this show, which is really um, satisfying because I have so much fun performing it. So I'm so glad that, you know, it's getting that reaction from uh, people who watch it and review it. But yeah, I was kind of really like, wow, this is the kind of review that you get once in a lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> and it's always good to have a good review rather than a bad review. Oh, God, I've had those, though. Well, everybody's, we've all had bad reviews. But you know, <laughs> what, I, what I've decided to do as we're sitting here talking, usually I tell people this is a little bit like a therapy session. Mm -hmm. But I've been searching the internet. I used to do a character called Nana Muscuri. Oh, yes. Remember Nana. her? I used yes. to do In Bed with Nana. Yes, I did. Well, for this particular episode of 15 Minutes of Fame, this is In Bed with Tanya. Oh, indeed. How does that feel? <laughs> that feels very comfortable. Mm. <laughs> well, make sure you get yourself nice and comfy, yeah. you know, because you, you might get a bit chilly at, uh, as the journey goes well, on. I'm very well practiced with therapy, so I think I'll be okay. Okay, lovely. <laughs> All right, so the first thing I want to do, in as we're now in bed, mm -hmm. uh, in bed together, I want to jump right back um, to when you were dancing on a little music show called Countdown. Mm -hmm. Tell us about Countdown and tell us about how you got to introducing Countdown, which was kind of the start of your TV career. Mm. Well, I was actually just mucking around in the studio and Molly saw me and he said, I'm going to get you to open the show. And then he went into the green room, I think, told them there's a girl that's going to open the show. And then I was opening the show. And I still remember what I had to say. I said, Said, Welcome to Countdown. Now here's Jason and the Scorchers. And I don't know where they are today. Um, <laughs> and, and they probably don't know where they are today either. It's a fickle business. Um, so, yeah, that's what I said. And then two weeks later, I got this phone call from Grant Rule, who was the executive producer, saying, would you mind coming in to do an audition for a new show? Now, the weird thing is that that day, this was in the day of answering machines, that day I had gone out and I had not put my answering machine on. And I had this feeling all day, someone's trying trying to contact me. Someone's trying to contact me. It was so bizarre. When I got home, of course, the answering machine was off. Next morning, phone rings at six o'clock and it was Grant Rule. And he said, we tried ringing you all day yesterday, but we figured you must have a day job because, you know, there was no one home. That's why we're ringing so early. And it was like, oh my God, you know, when you're so connected to the universe that you kind of know stuff. Have you ever had that experience? Look, I've had many experiences connected to the universe, but, but I don't know if we can go into it uh, <laughs> right here and now. What, something I wanted to ask you about that day on Countdown. You were origi now you originally trained at Victorian College of the mm -hmm. Arts, but you were a dancer. Is that right? Were you dancing at all in the show? Is that what yeah, you yeah, were doing? Yeah, yeah, that's what I was there for. You know, they had a group of Countdown dancers. That's what we did. And, um, yeah, it was just... That day I happened to be spotted and introduced the show. Now, that, that sort of spiralled from there, didn't I mean, you, you then did uh, The Factory for yes. the ABC yes. as well, and you were a roving reporter on The Factory. Well, the interesting story about The Factory was that, you know, I got that job. Okay, let me, how, how do I explain this? I got the job, but I got the job with them saying, we're giving you a job but we don't know if it's going to last because essentially they wanted the other girl and they took me as well because there was a bit of a, no, but we want her, no, no. And um, then there was rumours that I was going to be let go um, and the show was very straight at this stage and then I thought, you know what, bugger this. They didn't really care about what I was doing anyway so I just started doing whatever I wanted and I had a great producer who was right by my side going, yeah, let's do that. And so I wrote these things and, and we just would go out and film them and no one 
to check my work before it went to air. So suddenly, the, you know, like all this work's going to air and they don't realise that I'm kind of becoming popular and the media is ringing to speak to me and their fan mail is, um, you know, the bags are the same size as the guys and it's like, what? what, what? We've created what a monster, <gasps> you know? And the only reason that I got to do all that fabulous work was because no one gave a shit, you know, essentially. And do you I, think TV is still like that now? Do no, you think, no. Do you think no? God, no, I think it's so controlled and I watch people go into this machine and they're interesting, exciting people and within a year I watch them again and I think, what happened to you? Where did you go? You know, like they just sort of become, you know, they're selling egg sandwiches from Coles, you know, on their Instagram and I just sort of think, what happened to you? You were interesting and now you're just... Bought. Oh, of course, you you were kind of, you were doing sort of Norman Gunston kind mm. of stuff, weren't you? Mm. It was like guerrilla TV, yeah, yeah. Where you just kind of turn up, Nicole Kidman's yeah. at the airport, <laughs> and you're rocking up, screaming out to Nicole Kidman with the uh, TV crew right behind you. Mm. That's that's the sort of thing you were doing. The reason I started doing it is because no one would give me press accreditation from the factory ABC. A young girl, twenty three years of age, so I couldn't get into these things. So I just thought, well, I'll just go to them you know if they're not going to let me in I'll just go in and just and nobody's no one in the studio stopped you no because it's funny when you pretend that you belong somewhere and you look like you belong somewhere they'll let you in so you know they'd go you know pass and I'd, I'd come sorry I'm busy you know that was the reason why I started doing that because I couldn't get in on press credentials so look too some of those those episodes you did are very funny because I think I've now become your biggest fan <laughs> and I have stalked you totally <laughs> on social media but you you were you were sort of talking to some big people yeah. Cindy Lauper I mean Cindy Lauper was sick you brought a water bottle into yeah. her I mean what do you remember about that day walking into Cindy Lauper well I look back and I think I can't believe the people that I actually spoke with but Cindy was so gorgeous and lovely like she was just you know, like, she's exactly as she is. She's one of those stars who is as she is. Um, and she kind of got the joke, didn't oh, she? Oh, yeah, she played along. She was great. But, you know, like, I think that the way that I was interviewing people too was kind of refreshing for them because they get asked the same questions all the time on a press tour. So when someone comes in and just doesn't care about that and just starts asking whatever questions they like, they kind of appreciate it. Like, you know, yeah. there was one um, time that I, I was with the guy from Monty Python who's since died I can't remember his name because I'm old and I forget things and he asked me what was in my suitcase and I was dressed as my character and I said oh it's underwear I correct, collect from around the world and he goes oh would you like mine and he dropped his dacks <laughs> and took his undies off and gave them to me you know it was just like so many amazing things happened do you know one of one of the people you, I saw you I do the, you know, I think it was I think you did the same thing you kind of attacked the Prime Minister of Australia at the <laughs> time which was Bob Hawke on a, on a funny thing when I'm having my lowest days and we all you know everyone in who does anything in entertainment mm -hmm. has had those low days which we kind of spoke a little bit about mm. when you came in I would always say to myself what would Bob Hawke do <laughs> on these days and when I saw you doing this you know, kind of guerrilla TV with Bob Hawke, I said to myself, this is destiny, <laughs> which is where you started your conversation about the universe. Yeah, yeah. Earlier on, we are here today meant to do this this conversation. So we are destined together yes, in bed kismet. with Tanya. Yes, it's kismet. A question I did want to ask you now, you, of course, choreographed Locomotion for the lovely Kylie Minogue. Mm -hmm. What do you remember about doing that? What do you what do you hold in your heart now when you look back and you watch that music video? There was a lot of questions there. Yeah, but, um, um, see what well, you can tell us. First of all, I knew Kylie was going to be a star. There were a lot of people around just going, "This isn't going to work." I just knew she had like a steely determination. No, oh, I don't know if steely is the right word. A quiet determination that was um, not on display, but you know, I could tell she was very determined and very strong. I also, I just really liked her. Like, I really wished that we'd stayed in touch because I really dug her you know I thought she was a really great chick there was no there's no gossip to tell on this shoot no, you know she wasn't a prima donna there was nothing that went wrong it was turn up do the job go home and was it was the video shot in one day yeah wow that's was. quick because that's a 
people who've never made a video probably don't know this, mm. but a day to shoot a video is extremely. Oh quick. well, our bits were shot in. Your a day. bits were She'd shot. She shot other bits. Oh, okay. You know, prior. And after the video was over, one day I was just at my flat, and she just dropped by. You know, yeah. and just to say hi and hang out. And I was kind of like in the kitchen making tea, going, "Why is Kylie Minogue in my lounge room?" Um. <laughs> she wasn't singing the locomotion as you were doing making tea. <laughs> No, she wasn't, but she just came by and I just really liked that, you know. Did you did you um, uh, think about continuing dancing or did the TV take over and it, your, it got your um, attention? Okay, well, what actually happened was when I was at the College of the Arts in my second year there, um, a drunk teacher dropped me and I snapped the bottom half of my leg from the top half. Surgery, rehab, blah, blah, blah. But my knee never recovered enough to kind of train at that level of classical ballet like it just couldn't handle it so you wanted to do classical ballet yeah yeah and then I sort of that's a big change classical ballet to stand-up comedy I know I mean who thought I guess I'd always been funny like at school and stuff like and at VCA I was funny um but what happened was I moved into commercial dance because I could handle that like my leg could handle that and being in television studios of course led to me getting that audition which is the kind of the dream isn't it she's spotted she gets an audition she gets the job you know like who would have thought no one and you went you went on to host countdown revolution which was count the original countdown with a new name is well, it was, um, yes, Molly Meldrum came back to the ABC. He had made up with the head of artist, oh no, what was it, um, Arts and Entertainment. And, because they'd had a big, and they made up, and so they gave Molly this show, Countdown Revolution. And he was to executive produce it and use his contacts to bring stars to the show. But the show was a disaster because Molly was great at picking a hit and, you know, had in- incredible intuition with regard to music, but he wasn't an executive producer producer and the show was just a mess and in the end to cut a very long story short they fired everyone and just put me on hosting it with Mark Little and then the show started to rate and then they started going okay you can't stay there because they'd wanted anarchy 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 all the time anarchy we want anarchy and, and so and, and you created a little bit of anarchy as well because yeah, well that was what we did we gave them anarchy we went on strike you went on strike didn't you mm. but, but they fired you yeah they didn't want that kind of anarchy <laughs> they didn't want you sort of <laughs> saying what they doing what they wanted yes exactly and the irony is that 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 show was probably the best show that we ever did like the cuts were there they would cut to something and that's the show that they actually wanted and that's what we were trying to do you know like just get this show because normally we'd throw to a clip and then we'd be left hanging there for like five minutes and you know in this show that that day was the exact show that they wanted and they fired us but you know there was a whole lot going on behind the scenes we really played into their hands without knowing that that's what was going on and yeah do you know um i was through through the week i've been looking at a lot of the stuff you've done um you're not only a very good comedian but you're also a great actress your show reel is incredible because it invited me in it didn't take me on a downer mm-hmm. but i could see your talent each of those characters that you did uh, and and there was just enough drama there to let me know because i direct as well mm. let me know as a director that you had it in you to go the distance um, with some really tough roles as well, and I loved some of those moments in those in those films. There was one there was one film you did with Ben Mendelsohn, mm-hmm. and he was extremely young mm. and extremely good looking in it. Mm. I've got to say, back then, what was that film? Well, that film was by a really talented uh, Victorian College of the Arts student called Kerry Light. She now lives in New York, but she put Ben and I together, and I mean that kissing scene in a laundromat wasn't actually written in the script, and that was just one of those moments where we were we were shooting and the first time where we came nearly close to ki- kissing the d- director goes cut and we both went no <laughs> cuz it was just happening like that and then i sort of said to her you know just let it roll like see what where this goes and um so that whole kissing thing was just completely impromptu but thank you well um, i really think you know if stand-up comedy doesn't work for you <laughs> um, maybe you can be sort of directing show reels for people <laughs> because your show reel is is extremely good now you look you've had a you know so wealth of ex- experience 
what was that moment in your life where you suddenly, because you, you stepped out of it for a while mm. and then you came back in again. Do you remember that moment in your life where you went, I don't want this anymore? Well, I never mm-hmm. did. No? Um, no, it wasn't my choice to step out. I just couldn't get work. and So um, work just dried up yeah. totally? Totally. And, you know, like you've got to remember too, this was the late 80s, early 90s. I was a 23, 24-year-old woman and I was boisterous and loud and I was doing all these things and it was very confronting for some people. And, you know, like it it was also very risky for people to hire me. Like, what's she going to do? What's she going to say? It was, there was a lot of fear about it. And, you know, eventually the Would, Would they have reacted like that if you were a man? God, no. Because no. Norman Gunston yes. was doing the sort of things you were well, doing. Well, let me tell you, like 10 years later, you could watch um, The Chaser and they would do similar things to what I did and they called that innovative. Oh, look at these guys. This is amazing. This is hilarious. You know, and there's a lot. There's a part of me that feels like I didn't get the credit for what I did and how different it was at that time and being a woman. It's sort of been skipped over in television history. Like, oh, let's just go to the guys. Chaser, innovative, funny, yes. And so, you know, I didn't make a choice to step out of this industry. The choice was made for me. 20, I think it was 2014. I'm trying to remember Mm. all the things I read. In 2014, you were diagnosed with personality. Borderline personality. Borderline personality disorder. Just tell us what that is. Well, I think that's that's part of the problem too. That like that's such a an intense mental illness that sometimes I probably shouldn't have gone to work on those days when it was hard for me and I shouldn't have done it because what that did was just uh, label me as difficult or emotional or you know all the things that no one wants to know about. So that was really sad in that regard. But also the thing is that that disorder is why I'm able to put the things I I come up with on the page on the camera you know but no one wants the shit that comes with it so you kind of have to hide it but sometimes that's hard that's really hard work and I think that was a large part of my demise as well you know just not being able to control an illness that I knew nothing about so obviously you've learned a lot about it now because I think behind comedy quite often there's a lot of pain I Mm. think do you take your lessons in life I guess, and, and, you know, your issues with your health. Do you take that into your comedy? Look, the way I I don't actually, I mean, I do and I don't. I'm not prepared to sort of like, I am prepared to make fun of myself and what I've done and all that kind of stuff to get a laugh, you know. And I know that the point of um, the the next show was that she wasn't prepared to do that anymore and that that was where she had reached. I've never reached that point, you know, like because comedy for me, it's been the opposite. Opposite. It has saved me getting up and saying those things and allowing allowing the, the poison of them to be released and be funny, mm-hmm. you know, like to, to make it into something funny at where I'm the joke has been a huge relief and release for me. I did not reach a similar, you know, it's a very, very different journey. Um, and so that's why I've not stopped doing comedy you know because it is it's kept me alive and you you write all your own material yes i do yeah if i was coming to you i know nothing about your show Mm -hmm. and i'm coming to your show for the first time what would i expect well it's really a show about like you know looking for those moments in life where you can go that was great but you know the last few years there weren't a lot of those and I thought that there were and then when I looked back on it I went god I was that I was really actually quite depressed during that time wasn't I or god that was actually really tough but you know I make fun of all that and getting old like aging like suddenly that's become you know a big issue for me I need two knee replacements and it's like my god what um, terrible <laughs> you know so just things that you you might think, oh yeah, life's going, life's going great. Well, I'm here to remind you it's not. Um. <laughs> On comedy, I noticed you did a show in America, in Hollywood somewhere, um. it's called Urban. Oh yeah, I did Suburban Refugee. You, you, you yeah. forgot it, you forgot yeah. it. 
Um, are America is American uh, audiences different than than Australian audiences? No, I didn't find so. If you're doing stand up, they expect the discipline of stand up. Like I think in Australia we have a much broader definition of what stand up is, whereas in America stand up is set up punchline, set up punchline, and if you're not delivering a laugh in every thirty seconds, you're not a stand up, you're a storyteller. Mm-hmm. Whereas here we have a much broader definition that sort of encompasses a whole lot of things that mean that people will be called a, a stand up. I just would be careful. Don't call yourself a stand up if if you're getting up and doing storytelling. Okay. You know, like it pretty pretty strict. Yeah, because you because you you're trying to find a. I think I think it was you that said this. Um, you try and find a laugh a minute. Is yeah. that correct? Well, I mean, I I do actually try and get more than that, but um, <laughs> <laughs> at the very least, yes, there is. A laugh a minute. What happens if you ever done a gig where there's no laughter, or the laughter is so is you know coming every couple of minutes, mm. not not a laugh a minute? What what process would you go through to try and pick yeah, that up? That's interesting because you know I've got jokes that are never fail jokes that no matter what kind of audience you've got, they're going to laugh at this this particular line. When they don't, I know that it's not me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and because you can really talk yourself into a real problem on stage like should I be going faster should I just get this done what's going on sometimes I've actually stopped the show and go okay so why are we here like you know why did you come and and do do people answer yeah they do and they respond really well and I'm like are you enjoying it yeah I'm really enjoying it well can you laugh out loud you know like what's going on so you tell them can you laugh out loud yeah because that's the thing I notice people do. They will enjoy the show, but sometimes they're just too, you know, like if it's a small house, especially like you've got 36 seats in there and four of them have got people in them, you know, they don't want to laugh out loud. It's, it, they're very self-conscious. And I'm like, just just laugh out loud. Let's do it. Let's practice. Let's just do that. You know, it just breaks the tension and people start having more fun. If I said to you, what Australian comedian do you most admire? Who would you choose? Um, I mean, I admire Kitty Flanagan and the way she's run her career and her success. I think she's had a really strong rise and, you know, I think that's great. But the women I admire are more people like Nolene Brown, you know, sort of... That old Australian... Think back to the the women who were on television in the 70s and think and look at the women we have now on television and I just go, what happened? You know, like they're all one particular type of woman and back in the seventies, you had Nolan Brown, Denise Drysdale. They were they were the type of comedians you don't get anymore. No. They were broads. Yeah. And you know, and I think I mean Bette Midler's a broad, isn't yeah, she? Yeah. You know, nobody um, writes roles for broads. You don't see broads much doing comedy anymore. Maybe we need to bring back the broads. Yeah, and just like the the larrikinism that those women displayed. You know, they were larrikins. And I just don't feel like you see it on TV. I feel like it's died. And so I I miss those women. I miss those voices. Yeah, look, I, I, I hear what you're saying. I know those women that you're talking about, and, and I agree. They were gutsy and, and um, they, they were a little bit rebellious, mm-hmm. you know, in their attitude. Totally. Which is, you know, where you're coming from as well. Mm. You know, I said at the start of this that we were in bed with you. Tanya, you're in bed, you've got the sheets pulled up, the audience is just outside your bedroom door. What sort of things do you do to prepare before you walk out to talk to that audience? I actually pray. I always pray. You know, I, I do believe in a power greater than myself. I don't call it God. You can call it God. You can call it the universal power. You can call it whatever you like. But I do believe in a power greater than myself. And so I pray to that power before I go on. And then I do the superhero pose. And then I go out. <laughs> I, I was not expecting that. <laughs> um, and that, that seems like a really good uh, place to tell us your dates and where you're touring and the name of your show. Okay. Well, the show's called Tanya Lacey, Everything's Coming Up Roses. And I am in Melbourne performing at the Melbourne International Comedy Fest- Festival March 27 to April 9. And then I am in uh, Sydney May 3 and May 5 at the Sydney Comedy Festival. And then Townsville for Northern Australian Festival of the Arts. Tanya Lacey, I am praying that you get lots of people to your show. Thank you for coming and talking to me. This has been your 15 Minutes of Fame. Thank you.